and Bitcoin would leap up to 25 trillion. They would also create an avalanche of other mid-size and small countries buying Bitcoin. They would also create an avalanche of investors like the George Soros's of the world buying Bitcoin. Bitcoin would expand to be worth 10 trillion and then 100 trillion. Everyone that moves first ends up with a currency backed by Bitcoin. They actually solve the problem for, uh, for all the people in the nation. They solve their own problem. They fix the currency problem in the world and solve a whole set of other human misery issues. Today, we saw confirmation of reports that multiple Bitcoin spot ETF approvals are happening in Q1 of 2024. The massive $840 billion global bank Standard Chartered sent a research note to their investors confirming that in fact these approvals will be happening. We've also seen a bullish pattern recently of the Bitcoin dips being bought as buying pressure increases from Coinbase. Speculation surrounding BlackRock as the prominent player and custodial partner of Coinbase has been circulating as well. As we get closer to the halving in March of 2024, we're now a matter of weeks away from the entire cryptosphere being flipped upside down as major institutional capital will be pouring in. Today, Michael Saylor discusses his thoughts on Bitcoin and the crypto market. He believes the coming Bitcoin rally is a reflection of mainstream adoption and existing cryptocurrency investors acknowledging the place of the leading crypto asset in the ecosystem. Despite recent price gains, Saylor believes that the greater rally for mainstream investors is coming sooner than most expect. He is confident that Bitcoin will easily surpass 10 times its current value and believes we'll see a skyrocket in price with the halving just months away. Let's get right into the interview with Michael Saylor. If you enjoy the content we do here on this channel, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos just like this. The really big idea is the separation of property from the earth or the digital transformation of property. There are hundreds of trillions of dollars of capital that are, that are tied up in property like buildings and land. And if you look at the wealthy around the world, um, they store a lot of their wealth in property assets. And in an inflationary environment, when you're inflating the money supply by 7% a year, the only way to stay ahead of that is to have a balance sheet, which is property heavy. So I would say there's probably three drivers for Bitcoin's advancement. One is the digital transformation of property from physical property to digital property. The second is the conversion of corporate balance sheet from credit assets or, or debt assets, which are liabilities to property assets, which are, which are actually assets that are appreciating in value like Bitcoin. And the third driver is the digital transformation of money the ability to move money at the speed of light between uh, between uh, a corporation and their customers or their partners. And that's the lightning story. Mm -hmm. But but let me just touch on each of them because I think they're equally important. They're, they're very important ideas. If I have a billion dollar building in London and if the pound gets inflated by 7% in supply, then the currency I have loses 7% of its value between January 1st and the end of the year. Now I give you two companies. I give you a company that owns a billion dollars of land in London mm -hmm. or property. And I give you a company that has a billion dollars of um, debt, of, uh, of sovereign debt of the UK. On January 1st, if there's a 12% true inflation rate, <clears throat> the guy that owns the first company knows that his, his balance sheet's gonna go up by 12% and he's gonna make 121 million pounds by the end of the year. The guy that owns the second company is going to get a 3% yield and the debt is going to lose 12% of its value. And so the guy that owns the second company is going to lose. Well, actually, they're going to accrete by nominally by by 3% by 30 million pounds, but their assets won't be worth anymore. So there's a 90 million pound difference between a, a credit balance sheet or a debt laden balance. Uh, as I say credit, you're owning credit of the US uh, of the UK government. So the person that owns the, the credit is 90 million pounds behind the person that owns the property. And if you know, if you just take it to the extreme, you just own the cash, well, your cash is worth 12% less at the end of the year, your balance sheet of property is keeping track. So what you can see is that uh, over the course of 10 years, companies that own property 
at that inflation rate are going to find their property value triples. And over the course of the same 10 years, the companies that just have the cash are going to have the same amount of cash, but it'll be worth one third as much or something. The ongoing adoption of Bitcoin by governments, institutions and media signifies a broader recognition of its value. Me. However, Saylor asserts this journey is just beginning, comparing the initial years to the current widespread interest and investment with a giant spotlight on Bitcoin ETFs. Saylor highlights this being a significant development in the financial ecosystem. He also suggests that BlackRock, under the guidance of Larry Fink, will lead the charge in obtaining regulatory approval for a Bitcoin ETF. This move, he contends, will underscore Bitcoin's enduring relevance as an asset and its potential as a hedge against currency devaluation. The big idea here is uh, twofold. One, you don't really want to own billion dollar buildings in London. You want to own a billion dollars of a digital building that has no property tax, that can move to any city in the world, that can be upgraded with technology, right? There, there's a cost to owning the real estate. It's also, you can only buy the billion dollar building with a billion dollars of capital. But if you're a taxi cab driver in London, you want to acquire the building at 287 pounds a month. You know, you, you need to acquire incremental property. So digital property is better than physical property. And that means that you've got trillions and then tens of trillions and then hundreds of trillions of dollars of capital that should flow out of the buildings and the warehouses and the land into the Bitcoin network because digital property is, is just better. Lower maintenance, lower tax. You can buy it and sell it in smaller portions. You don't need to be a rich family in London with an army of lawyers in order to buy Bitcoin. Every company on earth that's required to hold its balance sheet in cash or cash equivalents is being bled 7 to 14% a year mm -hmm. by monetary inflation. And that's why all the companies fail. And that's why if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you want to be around in 100 years, you need a property company with all, your assets have to be property. They cannot be credit and they cannot be cash. And if you're trying to actually make money by doing something, like I'm a restaurant or I'm a hotel, the doing of something gets exponentially harder. When the money is, if, when the true inflation rate is 12%, you have to grow your cash flows by 12% in the UK this year in order to stand still. So statistically, 99% of companies cannot grow their cash flows 12% a year. You know, in a competitive market, if you don't have a monopoly, it's probably almost impossible for you to do that five years in a row. So when, when the, um, the political system creates a highly inflationary currency, if your business model is, uh, is to have no capital as property and be capital, capital weak or to hold credit as capital or cash as capital, then you have to literally grow your cash flows faster than the inflation rate. And that's why there's a 99% mortality rate on companies. That's what's destroying hundreds of thousands and millions of small businesses. And that's what causes monopolies to form in every sector in the world. It's because of the monetary policy of the government. You have to have an endowment mm -hmm. and, and the endowment has to hold non-cash instruments. Like if Oxford or Cambridge or if Harvard University or Yale, if they had an endowment that had cash, they would all be out of business. So the endowment has to have property type investments. And of course, the solution to all this is all those institutions, if you want your institution to last 500 years, whether it's your family or whether it's your church or whether it's your university or whether it's your country or your city or your government, you just endow it with Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin is the apex property. It will appreciate at a faster rate than the currency will debase and it has a lower maintenance cost than all the other property assets, and it's globally more scarce, more desirable. So there is a solution, but most institutions live in fear. Uh, they're either stuck in a fear, what is the word, like a, a doom loop, or they're, or they're uh, stuck in a traditional view, which is the bank is not allowed to have Bitcoin because it's against the regulator's rules. The endowment is afraid to buy Bitcoin because they're afraid they'll be criticized by it. Michael Saylor believes that while some investors were initially uninterested in Bitcoin and gravitated toward other cryptocurrencies, the recent tumultuous events of the past year 
have caused a massive influx of investors to return to the dominant crypto asset. He highlights Bitcoin's position as the reliable, trusted network that stands the test of time when other assets fail to provide stability. Saylor believes in the long-term potential of Bitcoin as an investment, despite the current scrutiny of crypto by the SEC. He says those with crypto assets are likely to trade them for Bitcoin anyways, which is seen as the most trustworthy crypto asset and network. Saylor notes that Bitcoin has been moving up about 50% a year on average over the last three years. Despite some short-term losses, MicroStrategy continues to remain the largest holding of Bitcoin in the world. Saylor remains bullish on Bitcoin and echoes the sentiment of many high-profile investors, saying that the crash of the US dollar will lead to a rally in Bitcoin, the likes of which the world has never seen. What do you think about the latest interview with Michael Saylor? And when will we see the massive rally in 2023? Comment down below. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll see you in the next video.